Uh, thanks for joining us um, at this uh, very special panel uh, that is co-organized by the American University and the National Gallery of Art. My name is Ying Chen Pan, an assistant professor in the Department of um, Art and um, also the um, uh, chair of the Committee of the Seventh uh, Feminist Art History Conference. It is with a great pleasure um, to be here uh, because um, this time around, we wanted to make our conference a little bit uh, than usual. In the past, uh, we usually had only two days of um, uh, conferencing, but this time we partnered with the National Gallery of Art to extend our discussion on where feminist art history goes. Um, in the museum. And today uh, I wanted to spearhead and uh, introduce our moderators and the presenters. Uh, first of all, let me introduce our moderator, uh, Mika G. Conway from the National Gallery of Art. So hi, Mika. Hello, good morning, everyone. Hi, and uh, we also have um, uh, Lauren Haynes from uh, Duke University Museum. Hi, Lauren. Okay. And uh, we also have um, um, Kathleen Morris from Brooklyn Museum. It's a pleasure to be here. Okay. And uh, Aksma Naim from Baltimore Museum of Art. Thrilled to be here. Thank you. And uh, Christine Shaka from Walters Art Museum. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Mm -hmm. And uh, Christina Yu Yu from MFA Boston. Pleasure to be here. Hi. Thank you. And now I will turn our time to our moderator, Mika. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be here with these distinguished panelists uh, to have been asked to bring this remarkable program to a close um, by moderating this special collaboration between our institutions. And because this session is open to the public at large, we might have a somewhat different and more generalist audience than has attended the rest of this conference. And uh, we've designed this program with that broad audience in mind. And over the next hour, this distinguished group of curators and thinkers will discuss some museum specific topics through the lens of feminism and social justice and how we can use our role as museums and the things that museums are uniquely positioned to do to advance greater equity and inclusion in our institutions and in the society at large. We'll leave plenty of time for audience questions and let the discussion take us where it will. So by way of an opening round, um, I wanna start with, with this question. Um, in an essay called Gorillas in Our Midst, a museum director's appeal for a new feminist agenda, Kaywin Feldman, the director of the National Gallery of Art, suggested that while the Gorilla Girls performed necessary pathbreaking work when it comes to the feminist critique of museums and deserve credit for many of the advances women have made in the art world, their militaristic covert methods are maybe outdated and no longer as useful. And that what the museum field needs now is not more uh, anonymous firebombs from the outside, but provocations from the inside. So my first question for each of you is, do you consider yourself an activist? And to the extent you identify as feminist, what does that mean to you? And how does it affect how you approach your curatorial work? Um, Catherine, you're, you got a little bit short shrift. You're, you're, you are the um, Sackler Senior Curator of the Elizabeth A. Sackler Center for Feminist Art at the Brooklyn Museum. And you've been in that position since 2009. Uh, you've often said that if you, were, if you are alive today and looking at art, then you've been affected or impacted by feminism. So um, do you wanna start us off? Sort of, do you consider yourself an activist? You know, to the extent you identify as feminist, what does that mean to you? How does it affect how you approach your work? Thanks, Mika. And first of all, I'd like to thank everybody at AU and the National Gallery for inviting me to participate in this panel. Um, the AU's long feminist art history conference has always been an inspiration and it's a pleasure to be here. I also want to start by saying that I am speaking to you today from the unceded ancestral homeland of the Mohican people. The Brooklyn Museum stands on the land that is part of the unceded ancestral homeland of the Lenape Delaware people. As a sign of respect, I recognize and honor the Mohican and Lenape Delaware nations, their elders past, present, and future generations. We are committed, the Brooklyn Museum is committed to addressing exclusions and erasures of indigenous peoples and confronting the ongoing legacies of settler colonialism in the museum's work. Which um, 
is a great place, I guess, to, to start <laughs> um, in answering your question. And I will answer you definitively by saying I do not consider myself an activist. Um, I think that to call myself an activist in the face of the incredible work by so many activists that I know and see in the world um, would be a disservice. I do see myself as political. I do see myself as engaged. I do see myself as um, thinking through political lenses and um, trying to um, be responsive to um, current needs around political imperatives. And your quote from me at the beginning is something I say a lot. <laughs> um, but um, along those lines, I do call myself a feminist. Um, I do use the word, um, even though I am aware of and vastly interested in the conversation around the limits and the um, complexities of that word. Um, I began and I work in an institution and in a part of an institution whose legacies are firmly connected to the story of second wave white stream feminism. Um, I think when I arrived at the museum in 2009, I understood pretty quickly that my role was to see um, the Center for Feminist Art as a space for methodological explorations more than an attempt to um, canonize histories um, of what was largely a white femi the white feminist movement. Um, I think that that focus has shifted most recently and most um, um, urgently to um, the idea of examining the complexities of second wave feminisms, its successes of course, but also its failures, um, particularly for communities that have not traditionally been represented in a place like the Sackler Center. So um, that was a lot and I'll stop talking. Thank you. <laughs> I'd love to hear from all of you sort of on this general topic to kind of set the stage and introduce yourself. So. Um, Asma, you are the Eddie C. and C. Sylvia Brown Chief Curator at the Baltimore Museum of Art. You're a specialist at, uh, in American art. Um, and I'd love to hear, do you consider yourself an activist? Thanks, Mika. I just want to say, first of all, my thanks uh, to the folks at the NGA, Ali, um, and the wonderful team there, as well as all the folks um, at AU. Um, I am, as some of you may know, an alum of the American University Feminist Program. I got my master's there and I'm indebted to the incredible scholarship of Norma Browdy, Mary Garrett, um, Helene Langa, Helen, Helen Langa, excuse me, and so many others. So I just wanted to say that um, that has shaped my thinking. And I think I would be remiss to, to say that um, those kinds of influences have shaped me to be a feminist along with the more personal ones that I think that we need to be talking about more outwardly and openly about, such as the fact that I was raised by a very strong mother. Um, my mother was a physician um, who studied in India and then came here as an immigrant um, and worked um, in uh, Baltimore City. And so seeing her as an example and seeing the other strong women in my family as an example um, showed me the ways in which women can shape um, so many different kinds of social um, um, discourses around uh, how, how society um, and culture move forward. Um, and particularly as a Muslim American, I, um, I wanted to note that as well. So for me, um, just coming from that background, I wanted to say that there are so many ways in which all of us bring our own experiences to the table in terms of whether we consider ourselves a feminist or an activist. And I, I certainly agree with Catherine, my um, esteemed colleague here, um, along with the rest of the panelists who I'm very honored to be here with, um, that there are far too many more um, um, soul bearing folks out there doing the work um, in terms of activism than the kinds of um, secure and um, luxurious positions that we hold. Lauren, I'm going to go next to you. The, um, you are the Patsy R. and Raymond D. Nash, or Senior Curator of Contemporary Art at the National, National Museum at Duke University. Um, and I am love your, your take on this. Yeah, just good morning, everyone. And just to echo all the things, very excited to be a part of this conversation. You know, I don't think I have much different answer about the activists 
part, I think there's a level of sort of just commitment and ways in which so many people who are activists and how they put themselves out there and the work that they're doing that just doesn't, um, what I do doesn't come close, I think, to that work. Um, I think a lot about ideas around feminist feminism, and yes, I consider myself a feminist, and I also, um, to Asma's point, really think about who have been my examples, you know, in life, but also in this field, um, and thinking also a lot about my work that I do, and thinking a lot about Black artists, and um, Black artists who often sometimes get left out of stories around art history, and who we're thinking about, and who we're showing, um, and really thinking about the examples of women in the field that I have had and how I've seen them make space, um, open up space, particularly thinking about Black women like Thelma Golden and Lowry Stokes Sims um, and Sharon Patton when I was a young student at Oberlin College and really thinking about the ways in which um, how everyone can move through our field and move through their feminism and their commitment in very different ways. And this idea that it doesn't just have to be one way of thinking about this is something um, that I feel like sometimes gets left out of the conversation, right? I think there's a this idea that, okay, there's one way to be a feminist. There's one way, you know, and I think sort of a lot of what Catherine was talking about and how there are just many ways that we need to approach this and think about it and how I think for me, there are so many more smarter people thinking about this that I sort of look to to think about um, how I can make an impact and have a part of the conversation going forward. Thank you. So Chris. Christina, I'll turn to you now as the um, Matsutaru Shoriki Chair of the Department of the Art of Asia at the Museum of Fine Arts of Boston um, to know how your feminist, or, or do you consider yourself that, how does that, how does that um, play out in your own curatorial work? Well, thank you, Mika, and I also want to add my thanks um, to the organizers of American University and the National Gallery of Art. Um, and uh, I'm not sure if I do directly answer your, or not directly answer your question, Mika. I'm not sure if I have a lot more to add, you know, from what my colleagues here have been added. I think, you know, looking back, you know, I certainly do not, you know, you know, in a way echo what my colleagues have been. I, you know, I do not see myself as a activist. I, I agree, you know, if I identify that as really a big disservice to a lot of other people who are doing the hard work. But I think in my work, you know, um, I think especially recently, as you know, I think also my own experiences, you know, have grown tremendously. You know, I do either consciously or unconsciously trying to bring at least the recognition of women's contribution to our field, to the you know to to the forefront, you know, right? and also, I actually really appreciate you know what um, my colleagues have said. You know, looking back at my own um, history or the way I grow up, you know, I also recognize you know there are some women. Um, you know, I don't think any of them would recognize themselves as you know um, women, you know, activists, but I think they really shaped you know the way I. Um, the way I, you know, I am now, you know, that also, you know, of course, you know, and I want to thank as my raising, you know, your, the, you know, topic of your mother, you know, I think back, you know, you know, probably only recently I realized how incredibly my mom has shaped the way I am. And also think of my career in a way, very unconsciously, you know, when I was starting when I was in graduate school and now, you know, as a museum professional, really looking at, you know, some of them accomplished, um, um, female colleagues in the field. And uh, um, and through, you know, my own career and you know, looking at them as my inspiration, as my model. So in a way, I think this, you know, we are all in our own way contributing to bring women more to the forefront of this discussion, but not necessarily in a, in a politically active, activist sense. Thanks, Christina. Christine. You are a curator of European art from 300 to 1400 CE, very specific time frame, uh, at the Walters Art Museum in Baltimore. Um, and you know, I know personally from our our long professional relationship and some of the work that you the work that you did at the Getty Museum and the manuscripts collection there and your exhibition on illuminating women. You know, you've spent a lot of time thinking about this as well. And I want to know how have your views of feminism and, and feminist practice play out in your, in your work? 
especially with historical collections. Thank you, Mika, I really appreciate it. And I'm, I'm so honored to be part of this uh, panel. Um, like Catherine, I will start with um, a land acknowledgement. Um, this acknowledgement recognizes the original stewards of the land on which the city of Baltimore and subsequently our museum, the Walters Art Museum was created and specifically states that the Walters Art Museum exists on the unceded ancestral lands of the Susquehannock and Piscataway nations, as well as the home territory of the Lumbee and Cherokee peoples. Um, <clears throat> yes, Mika mentioned that um, I am indeed um, a medievalist and I hadn't really thought about, um, I do consider myself a feminist, I think going back to um, always using the example of my grandmother who was um, one of the first women to work for the Democratic Party in New York City, in fact, starting before women had the right to vote. So um, I think that's always sort of uh, underpinned my, my approach to, to my period of art history, um, the Middle Ages. And, um, you know, in the Middle Ages, we're working with so few um, documents as opposed to some other periods. And so um, the thoughts and aspirations of large swaths of society are really lost to us today, um, especially those voices of, of women. And um, so indeed, um, uh, you know, when we do have these documents, they're written about men, they're written by men quite frequently. And so um, in the work that I did at the Getty and the um, um, Illuminating Medieval Women project, um, both the book and the exhibition was to try to uncover those female uh, voices in the actual objects that come down to us from the Middle Ages. Um, so I was looking at works depicting women, um, works commissioned by women, works created by women where we knew that that was the case. So um, um, I can't really say that I'm um, an activist per se, but what's become apparent to me, and I think to um, a lot of museums, at least in the last year, maybe more, is that um, museums do have the ability to enact change and to make meaningful um, community connections. So um, in so doing, I'm sort of um, hoping to promote these initiatives through the vehicle of the museum institution. And I think, um, you know, museums can be activists, even if individually we might not feel ourselves to be, to be that way. I think that institutional backing, we can, we can enact change. Thank you. Thanks, Christine. I mean, I want to get at a little bit of this, more of this question of sort of inside versus outside and, you know, being, being the effectiveness of being inside the museum as opposed to being outside. And maybe again, start with Catherine because you have a long, have a long history as an independent curator, um, you know, working outside of the sort of institutional structure. And I've, and I've read some of what you've said in interviews about sort of that shift of coming into the institution and, and, and you know, have, having that perspective. Um, so maybe, you know, and, and then Christina, you've also spent time in the, in the sort of commercial, on the commercial side, um, you know, Asma, you know, you entirely changed careers, um, but you were very much, you know, within the, the sort of power structure um, as it started your, your career as an attorney and a prosecutor. Um, Lauren, you were considering law, as I understand it, you know, before you um, found the art history path. So I'm, I'm, I'm kind of curious, you know, how, how you see what, you know, the difference or sort of the, the sort of um, advantages of, of working from within the institution working inside an institution and, and I did never work inside an institution before I began at the Brooklyn Museum 12 years ago. So, so the, the learning curve for me when I arrived was steep, um, but um, the longevity of my tenure there now has certainly given me um, uh, a sense of in the last year and a half, I have to say has given me a sense of um, the power that I'm perceived to have, even if I often feel that I don't have it. And um, it has made me realize that it is um, incumbent upon me to, to, to act as if in some sense, to use that power in a way that I think I did not really ever feel that I could. And, and, and what I mean in relation to that specifically is in um, making space for um, more colleagues thinking about the way that a curatorial department within a large institution, which all of us work in, is seen as powerful in ways that other departments are not. And to operate from a um, base of knowledge about that and to think about what that means, um, both in um, sort of administrative um, interactions within the institution and um, equally importantly, creatively thinking about what that means for actual curatorial practice. 
Anyone else have thoughts on this sort of inside outside? If not, we can move on. Um, so the next sort of big topic is like gender equity in museums um, specifically. And I, I'm gonna share some statistics here that I think help kind of give us a, an objective starting point. So in, in 2015 and 2018, the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation sponsored an art museum staff demographic survey that showed that the, the overall art museum workforce is about 60% female, including at the director level. And the Association of Art Museum Directors membership currently is 51% female, which suggests, you know, facially that women have achieved parity. Um, of course, a closer look shows that institutional power when you measure it by metrics like overall museum budget or managerial responsibility or compensation still heavily associated with men. Um, among the dozen or so largest AAMD museums by budget size, for example, only two of them are led by women. And the 2018 um, iteration of the Mellon Foundation survey showed that although the curatorial, the curatorial ranks uh, overall are 73% female, once you start controlling for executive or senior management responsibilities, that drops down to 60% female. And a salary survey conducted by the AAMD in 2014 showed that women in art museums made on average 79 cents for every dollar made by a man. And we can assume that the average is worse if the woman is not white. The American Alliance of Museums is currently conducting a demographic survey um, where staff, uh, volunteers, boards, independent contractors of all kinds of American museums are being asked to self-report demographic data. And we might also speculate that those results will show uh, an even greater concentration of men at the very top, for example, on museum boards. So what should we make of these facts? Why has the sheer number of women in our field not led to greater gender equity? And if diversity along to all dimensions matters, is there a danger of our field becoming too female? So Asma, you know, much of your work has been about exposing these kind of structural imbalances. Um, so do you wanna start us off on this topic or on this question? Happy to Mika. Um, I think I, I, I was reflecting on this question and I think you know, the, the ways in which we all want to answer this question um, that have been already discussed in various kinds of forum about, um, about these inequities. I think I don't, I don't wanna repeat those kinds of obvious things. I wanted to go a little deeper and talk about perhaps um, the, the ways in which there's a visibility issue and then an invisibility issue um, that I find to be a nagging um, concern for me. So, uh, you know, I first in terms of visibility, there are, a number of incredible, talented women who are making incredible progress for their institutions in leadership roles. And that is, um, yes, you gave the statistics for directors, but there's also a number of women who are the head of boards, for example, um, at the Baltimore Museum of Art, we have Claire Zamosky siegel as, as the head of our board. And I know that she has been instrumental in affecting the kinds of changes that we have been wanting to do. Um, also along those lines, you know, um, senior leadership teams at major institutions are often comprised of women. Um, at the Baltimore Museum of Art, um, our senior leadership team is all women, but for the director, Chris Bedford, who's male. And so I know that there is um, systemically that kind of pattern overall. And so then that leads to the question of, well, why aren't they at the director position? And that gets to my point about invisibility and um, invisible labor, um, to use a term that's um, brought um, to um, exemplify the kinds of um, struggles that working mothers have, for example, um, or other kinds of um, workers in other kinds of spheres. And so for me, this idea of invisible labor boils down to the ways in which women are making a lot of the decisions that drive an institution on a daily basis. Are they getting credit for that? That's one question. Are they the ones that are noted um, in the in the in um, what I call you know this, the social media for me is something that's quite foreign. So I call it the Facebook just to be funny, but I understand that folks are on Facebook, um, you know, Instagram, etc. Um, how are um, our media outlets 
continuing to propagate the ideas that males are making power, uh, the, all the powerful decisions. Um, so that's one thing. How can they dig a little deeper and go beyond the surface effects uh, that we all want to gravitate towards? Um, the, the other thing is mentorship. Lauren Haynes mentioned some fabulous mentors um, for many of us in the field. And those mentors do a lot of invisible work. There's phone calls, there's, there's meetings, there's you know, late at night um, email exchanges with these um, women mentors that, um, that they are giving um, them their time and their effort for. And that relates to the discussions in the academy about how women are doing um, more acts of service than their male counterparts um, and not necessarily getting tenure because they're focusing their time on these kinds of acts of service. Um, so I, I wanted to talk about that. And I also wanted to mention the idea that, you know, you only learn by doing. I truly believe that. And so if women are going to advance into these director roles, there's got to be a more porous process between those in the leadership roles and those directly below them. There's got to be an opportunity for the women who are working around male directors to be interfacing with the board, to be learning more about fundraising strategies, to be working with the major grant institutions, to be doing whatever is, is um, kind of the, the um, directorial responsibilities of an institution, because that's the only way that people will start to perceive them in that role. And that's the only way they're going to acquire those skills. Yeah, that's that's a great point about, and and I look forward to you know talking. We have another question about sort of development, you know, and that's another form of that. And um, that's a that that is a great point that we often don't um, get that exposure, or you you know people aren't consciously thinking about succession planning or how to how to um, you know bring along the next the next generation. Um, other thoughts on the sort of. The, the makeup of the field and, and whether we're actually more, more powerful, you know, in fact, or that we, that we let this sort of narrative, that this narrative is sort of um, not accurately reflecting. It's sort of that, you know, sort of a chicken and egg, or we, do we feel that we're not advancing or we're not influential because we're being shown these, these statistics? Um, how do we make that more visible? Lauren, you look like you're ready to say something. Yeah. You know, I think it's really interesting and I think it's true. There is, there are many institutions where there are women in a lot of senior leadership positions and doing really fabulous work um, across the country, everywhere. Um, and I also think there, particularly recently, has been a lot of movement with boards and sort of, you know, realizing the makeup and realizing who is in those leadership positions. But I do think um, the qualifications or the perceived qualifications still feel very different for women. And then I think also coming from a place as a woman of color, black women thinking about that a lot, right? This idea that, you know, we would need to, um, in, a, in an ideal world, right? Everyone would be prepared to take on a director position, right? Sort of have that experience with finance, have that experience with working with boards and all these things. Um, but I think boards are still more willing to take a chance on a white man who doesn't have that experience to be able to you know, learn on the job, so to speak, or, oh, we can teach him and help him. And I think there's that inequality and that inequity continues to exist, despite, I think, you know, some amazing programs like Center for Church Women Leadership that I participated in that's trying to help all curators who are interested in these positions get different skills. Getty has, lead there are many programs that can provide this, and I think there are many directors as well that um, want to help and support their curators and their senior leadership to get that. But I think we are still at a point where those that are making the decisions at many large institutions across this country still have a perceived notion of who a director is and what a director should look like. Um, and I don't know if the numbers of having so many female, particularly white female curators in our field is really um, gonna change that anytime soon until that change comes from that level and sort of they look a little bit deeper. Catherine. Um, so much to say. Um, I, I, along the idea of invisibility, I 
it's, it's so important. Um, it actually made me think of, of some research I was doing around the 10th anniversary of the Sackler Center. And we started looking at um, the history of, 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 of the collections. And there are so many collections in our, that we have in the museum that are named for the male donor. And when we did research, we found that in many, many cases, those donations were actually ma often made by a wife after a husband's death. So I think that there's ways of exploring history that also allow us to bring people to the fore who were not to the fore. Um, and a um, couple of other thoughts, you know, and after the productive conversations just made by my, my, made by my colleagues, I'm feeling a little bit like a downer, but I want to also sort of acknowledge that, um, you know, perpetuations of entrenched systems of racism and sexism are not just perpetuated by men. Um, and that's an important part of um, the relearning, the unlearning, the new learning that, that many people who are in positions of power hopefully are undertaking and, or trying to undertake. And, um, um, and those forms of oppression obviously cross many um, intersectional issues from disability to ageism to the entire shift in all of our conversations about what gender even means. Um, and then the last thing I'll just say, which I think is also really interesting, you know, and, and what about those of us who don't want to be directors, who still want to have power, right? Is the directorship the end goal of everybody's career? It's not mine. So what are ways of power sharing that can really shift fields rather than um, working with what we got, which I know is something that we're all thinking about, but just sort of wanted to throw it out there in addition to um, all the other great ideas. Any other thoughts? Okay. Um, from my experience and, you know, my career, I'm, I'm sorry to say that I do sort of tend to think along the lines of what the AAMD survey showed us. Um, I've worked at 10 museums throughout my career, large and small in terms of budget and size and, um, you know, from county museums, university art museums to the Met and the Getty. Um, and it's only upon arriving at the Walters that I encounter my first female director of a museum that I've worked for, Julia Marshari Alexander. So, um, you know, I, I tend to, and, and I completely agree with you. I mean, we can't only look to the directors, but it does sort of beg the question when you have this incredible, um, you know, museums driven from the bo bottom, almost to the top um, by women, you know, why, why are we sort of lacking that? Um, what everyone looks to as as being the real the real leader of the of the institution, even if that is not the case, maybe should not be the case. Um, I can also tell you that our curatorial staff at the Walters, we are eight curators, all of whom are are women. We're not all white women, but um, you know, we've often thought, you know, is this sort of where we should be? Do we need more gender equity within our within our department as we hire um, new curators? Um, but I can also on the flip side tell you that this has been you know, the most supportive and amenable group of colleagues that I've, that I've ever had in my career. And um, you know, is that because we're all women? Is that because of the mix of personalities? I don't know what the answer is, but um, you know, I've noticed a change and I, I worked twice at the Walters. So I've seen sort of two different um, demographic makeups uh, in terms of gender um, in, in my department. So, um, and, so I, I, I see a real, a real shift um, happening there. And, um, you know, I have thought about this question quite a lot and I guess I, I'm not bothered by um, the sort of relative lack of men working in museums simply because, you know, my background is coming from an art history academic um, background. And I, I feel like it reflects a lot of the demographics of that, that group of what you see in graduate schools. So I, I've never been terribly bothered by, um, you know, majority women, just because I feel like it reflects how the career is built up. But um, by the same token, I mean, there needs to be um, definite, um, you know, better racial equity. And, and, you know, I think we do have to sort of worry, do we not have a multiplicity of voices if we have, um, you know, a women driven institution. So I, I, I'm feeling very conflicted about this conversation. But um, I think um, certainly having a woman at, at a director level, it, it does change the sort of um, look and feel of an institution and, and how, how it's run, so. I, um, I have a small point I want to add. I think it also goes to the issue of recognition and ownership. I think 
a lot of times when we see, you know, especially in the press or, you know, in the media, when a, a museum accomplished something, you know, and that recognition normally always goes to the director. The director get quoted in the press and all the other people who contributed to that success or that project basically became anonymous. And as we discuss now, we know actually a lot of the contributors to that success were actually women. But then we all became anonymous in this kind of recognition of the museum's accomplishment, move forward or, or success. So and that's also something, you know, it goes to, you know, yes, um, you know, somehow, you know, the percentage of men being direct is higher, but maybe it's also something, you know, when they get recognized or the press recognizing that the museum success, you know, there'd be more call out of women's contribution and shared um, success, you know, and then recognize everyone's contribution. Yeah, and that's a huge part of that, that, just that inclusivity and that recognition and that valuing of, of all of the kinds of, of labor that happens um, in a museum and not just, you know, what I have to say, one of the things that, um, I mean, I understand why they did it, but one of the things that I always, you know, that's, I just keep coming up against is, is the, the focus, you know, on, on, or even just the terminology used, you know, in the Mellon Foundation studies when they they segment, you know, there's museum workforce as a whole, but then they go out of their way to segment, you know, the intellectual leadership of the curatorial conservation ex ex executive leadership um, and education. Um, and, you know, from my perspective, there's a, there's a whole lot of other, we're all museum professionals, you know, and, and we're, we're all um, sort of intellectuals or, or have the ability to be leaders, you know, from, from wherever we are in the organization, sort of how can museums cultivate that kind of, um, that kind of recognition so that no one's anonymous, you know, and then that everyone's sort of recognized and valued for what they bring. Mika, I just, I just want to reiterate what you just said. I think that's really crucial. And I, I want to radiate out from that and just say that there's so many different ways in which information is manipulated and shaped. Um, and so no matter the best efforts that our director may have in terms of making that recognition, um, um, you know, claim, you know, uh, letting people know that there's other folks who are working just as hard mm -hmm. as, um, as he is. The shapers of information, those who present the news to us, those who present the statistics to us, have got to understand in which that bias comes through. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I mean, just in my, you know, I, I've started to try to consciously avoid using the word, you know, museum professionals to mean, um, or professional staff, you know, to mean a certain, because, because again, it's just, it, it's sort of just realizing sort of the own, my own sort of the bias that I brought to that term and, and, and um, to that, that implicit and stuff and that everyone knows what you're talking about um, and that you're not talking about, you know, the security staff or the, and that's, so I'm, I'm really um, consciously um, pushing back on this, even for myself. And I would encourage us all to do that. Um, so I'm going to, we have more to cover and, and time is going by this, um, we could sit here for hours, I think. Um, so I want to get at that kind of the intersectionality piece. Um, and you know, when, when Linda Nothan wrote in, why have there been no great women artists about the structural and historical, um, you know, reasons for the dearth of women artists in the canon, the traditional canon, you know, you read that now and, and you think, well, she could as well have been talking about artists, um, the dearth of artists who are not of white European heritage. And I'll just use my own institution as an example at the National Gallery of Art, which does collect predominantly European and American art. As of 2020, the best available data we had showed that the artists represented in our collection were 92% male and 98% white. And uh, in 1941, when the National Gallery was inaugurated, this the racial disparity wasn't so startlingly different from you know the country as a whole, um, the demographic makeup of the country as a whole. But now it's obviously very much out of alignment um, with our with our current nation national demographics, um, which the latest census showed to be about forty percent people of color, and which is projected by twenty forty five to be majority people of color. So, but still within art museums, and again going back to those uh, AAMD surveys, the Bellman Foundation surveys you know, they revealed a workforce, an art museum workforce that on a whole is, is only 28% people of color. So still 72%, um, you know, disproportionately when you benchmark against the population as a whole, disproportionately non-Hispanic whites. And some of the structural and historical reasons um, 
for the exclusion of women from the canon and from the workforce have probably operated similarly to exclude or erase or disempower uh, non-white artists and museum workers, but many of the reasons may be different. And of course, as we've started to talk about, you know, there's other ways that power imbalances divide us along lines other than race or gender, like economic ability, geographic, class-based um, biases and inequities that play out specifically in how museums operate. So what can a social mu justice museum practice um, that's focused on addressing racial and ethnic disparities learn from the longer um, legacy of feminist museum practice? And are there aspects of that struggle um, for women's equality that haven't served um, or even undermine the struggle for racial equality? Um, this is not a, not a new idea, um, you know, this sort of critique of second wave feminism, but I'd love to, to hear um, how we can how we can you know use use our museum roles and 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 what museums do um, to do this and if you you know have other additional thoughts on that on that critique. So Christina, as a curator of Asian art, you know who worked who who's worked globally and studied you know cross cultural exchanges of like you know Chinese art in Japanese collections, for example, or you know and you work with um, you see this you may, you see um, you know your coworkers or, or these dynamics or not playing out in, in museums in other countries. Um, how do you see this um, in your work? Yeah, that's, it's, it's a really large topic, you know, and I think, you know, historically in the museum and also in art history field, you're especially talking about East Asian art, you know, yes, you know, women artists, you know, um, is a very understudied topic, even, you know, and, you know, and of course, you know, MFA Boston is an example where, you know, even though we said our collection is one of the oldest in the country, but all of our early collectors were white male who went to Asia to collect, you know, so our collection is really shaped through a very specific lens. And, you know, and we still um, work with, you know, that lens and in that consequence in a way that, you know, in order to, correct it and also make East Asian art more fuller or Asian art fuller, you know, there's a lot of work for us as curators to do, you know, and uh, it's, it's not, it's not an easy work, you know, and also curatorially, you know, of course, you know, a lot of our knowledge or in the way we do, you know, we also build on academic, you know, um, um, scholarship, you know, and basically in, in, in Asian art in general, you know, even that study of, um, feminist art or women art, it's still very, very um, under, under limited with, with very limited and understanding, even though recently, of course, there's a lot of more progress and really enrich our understanding, you know, but, you know, that is really the very first basic step. And that's a very a small part of the foundation. And then how to even translate that academic work that in a more advanced stage of understanding than what the museums and curators do and make that into what we can do, incorporate that into our work, and then translate it into what we can share with our public. I think that's really a long way to go. Um, so, but, you know, at least I think now, you know, symposiums like this, you know, we are really addressing that issue, very, we are very consciously confronting that issue, and also, in a way, trying to put ourselves into an uncomfortable position. And I think hopefully that can push, you know, push out, push us forward and really, um, in a way, really to, um, to correct the history that, you know, we're inheriting. Other thoughts on, on the sort of interplay or, or between between gender and, and race, for example. Yeah, for, for example, you know, right now we have, you know, we talk a lot about, you know, in terms of building our collection, can we broaden, you know, starting, you know, or to broaden our collection into uh, women artists, you know, but even with that, it, with the limitations, because a lot of our understanding of, you know, if we, know the identity of an artist and that's very much you know pointing to 20 and 21st century and then with a museum like us you know majority of our collection or uh, is historical one then how we even you know think about our historical collection and expanding our collection and representing more women artists what does that even mean to us i 
have a sort of related question that's coming from the audience um, that sort of combines some of the things we talked about with last question and, and this. So this past year and a half has really laid bare the endemic issues, inequities, and precarities of labor and economic security in the museum world. And I would love to hear the speaker's thoughts about labor practices in our field and how, if at all, you understand labor as a feminist issue. Anyone wanna take that? We'll, we'll talk a little bit more later about sort of routes into the field. And I do, I do think that the, um, you know, the sort of way you come in or the, the sort of um, the idea of an unpaid internship. And I don't know how many of us, I was lucky to never have to do an unpaid internship, but not, not everyone is. Um, but the first internship I had, you know, I think it paid like $13,000 for nine months and it had no health benefits or anything like that um, in an expensive city. Um, and that's simply not, you know, we all know that that's, that's just, that, that excludes uh, a lot of people. Um, and so we have this field that is, you know, the conventional wisdom says it's, we, we don't pay enough. We don't, you know, museums that, that people want to work in, are, you know, are clustered in these expensive cities and people are so, um, so keen to get their foot in the door, you know, that they'll, they'll sort of take these low wages. And, and I think, I think, you know, museums have historically been inattentive to, to workplace culture. You know, you haven't tried to really try to attract and retain top talent because people passionate, smart people would come and they would want to work and they would want that resume burnishing and all that. So, so we, we have, you know, work to do, but, but at the same time, like, you know, the whole question of the living wage generally, not just in museums, but in, in lots of sectors, um, you know, how, how do we, how do we, how do we pay more equitably? How do we, how do we help, you know, I mean, the, the, to the extent that this is a symptom too of bigger, economic inequality and, and, and income inequality in the society at large, you know, where, where can museums, which are seen relatively powerless, you know, at the low end of the money structure um, in terms of resources, um, what can we do? <laughs> no one has a solution, Catherine. I do not have a solution. In fact, <laughs> I want to, um jump back actually to the to your initial question you know i was i was struck by your noting the was it 98 percent white 92 percent men on the alignment with 1941 demographics Correct. which was about I mean, the 90%, other percent 90 percent white the country was 90 percent white in 1940 but i think that the important key in those those stats is when did those collections become even shifting that eight percent or that four percent right that's I'm sure much more recent Absolutely. and um and that's sort of just maybe indicative of you know inroads of you know you mentioned social justice and and um and strategies right. of uh some you know effort on the part of all the people in this room and, and other very important people long before us who some of us have already mentioned today um and um I guess my thought is that, you know, strategies for social justice and strategies for political action um, that are often called feminist um, emerged in a time in alignment with other social justice movements, obviously the civil rights movement, um, the disability rights movements and others. So I think that while, um, inroads can be pointed to on the part of white women primarily, um, those successes are built on a lot of, you know, as asthma raised earlier, invisible labor, even in that context. Mm -hmm. So, so I'm, I'm interested in, in what that means. Um, I'm also interested in, um, particularly in what's gone on in our world in the last year and a half or so in really watching out for the systematic retrenchments that happen in situations that, you know, I think we can all point to historical moments in the last 50, 60 years where something seems to have peaked for a moment and then receded in terms of visibility um, for black women artists, for, for women, black artists, women artists, you know. Um, but I think that what we really have to be on the, the search for is these actions that feel like retrenchments. And um, one of them that I feel right now is a very large 
two museum retrospective to a white man that costs so much money and nobody's sort of talking. I don't want to say nobody's talking. I hate when say, nobody says, when people say nobody's talking because inevitably somebody's talking, but that just the, the kinds of ways in which those conversations kind of take us back to the place of comfort for the power structure of the institution. And somehow I feel like I've gotten off subject. So, but that is maybe factors in there somewhere. Other thoughts. Okay, I'm, I'm going to move on to um, another sort of broader subject about, you know, which we started to touch on, but, but to call out explicitly how museums are uniquely positioned uh, to foster gender and racial equity. Um, so in the current discussion of how institutions can promote diversity, equity, access, inclusion, you know, there are a lot of things on a museum's to-do list, um, diversifying staff and boards, fostering, you know, an inclusive uh, culture of belonging, promoting equitable, transparent pay practices, creating accountability around stated institutional values, creating engaging pro relevant programming. Um, but of course, collections, are at the heart of, of what we do. And, and you know, to, to Catherine's point, you know, we, from this point forward, hopefully we're doing what we can to, to rectify racial ethnic gender gaps uh, and, and sort of collect, make the tent bigger, right? I think to quote someone, I think Asma, Asma has said that, but, but you know, how do you, um, so we can, we can control what we do going forward, you know, but we don't throw the baby out with bathwater. And, and we look at the totality of our collections and the sort of many of us, I'm sure all of us can tell a story about, you know, the wonder and the joy and the curiosity that we felt, you know, encountering a work of art um, and believing in the potential of, of any work of art by any artist of any identity to spark that in any viewer, regardless of their identity or lived experience. So can we talk about the role of the curator when it comes to historical collections, you know, the traditional canon, the old masters, which, you know, our and art museums can be some of our unique and greatest strengths. How do we leverage them to, um, again, I'll, I'll paraphrase my boss, Kaylin Feldman, shine a light on these issues and, and promote thoughtful dialogue about inequities in the, in the past and, and as they play out in the present. You know, so what's the role of the museum uh, and a curator in particular in shaping, you know, using a museum's assets to shape a better future and not just reflect or document the past? So Christine at the Walters, as I mentioned, you know, you're responsible for a, a very historic collection. You're a medievalist by training. Um, how do you approach your objects from a, a modern and inclusive perspective? Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, I think one of the things that we're working towards is, um, especially for us with a primarily historical collection, is to dismantle this idea of the encyclopedic museum. And I just wanted to reflect again on what um, Christina mentioned, which is that you know, many of the collections we have in North America today are the result of certain 19th and 20th century uh, collecting habits and tastes. So rather than, you know, we have to be careful that the public is not sort of taking this as a face value and that we don't take it at face value um, as an accurate and complete picture of, of past history. Um, but to understand why the strengths of the collections are what they are and what are the gaps and, and what, how did that occur? So um, in our case, um, you know, asking questions like, well, why did William and Henry Walters not collect African art, for example? Um, and why then starting in the mid nineties, did the Walters um, amass one of the largest collections of Ethiopian art outside of Addis Ababa? So um, there's a lot of shifting that I think we need to do. So um, a few things, sort of concrete things that I think we can do as institutions um, we have um, rewritten our Walters history that we put as our sort of background document on our website um, to acknowledge that the wealth accumulated by the Walters family was um, built through Southern account economies that were really driven by the labor of enslaved peoples. Um, we have also thought very carefully and we were beginning this process of reinstalling our permanent collections. And um, one thing that I've been thinking really about is to, um, you know, I think for my period, we often, uh, almost every medieval conference I go to, we have discussions of, you know, how do we stay relevant? Well, I think, you know, the Middle Ages remain relevant and unfortunately are currently being used in ways that um, by certain um, parties today that we would not like, in a way that we would not like to see the Middle Ages used. So we're sort of fighting against that, but also um, thinking about some themes that run through historic art that are 
um, as close to universal as we can get them to be. So um, issues of power, childhood, mourning, um, the afterlife, these sorts of things. Um, and cultures have been dealing with these sorts of issues for, for thousands and thousands of years. So, and obviously we, we still are today. So, um, you know, can we think about um, theme as being sort of one of these equalizing um, ways of presenting art in our galleries that that most museum visitors can do can um, connect with because they're dealing with these things in their own lives. Um, also, can we bring in um, different voices and perspectives on various objects? So um, whether that be from museum uh, staff that is not curatorial staff, or from our visitors, or from artists, things of that sort. Um, as you know, I think the investment of those outside voices. Um, brings people back and and sort of engenders community engagement in in the um, the life of a museum. Um, also, community advisory groups are an incredible way that um, we've sort of started to ramp that up this year as a way to um, bring in voices that we maybe haven't heard in the museum before. And um, I think we we always um, many of us have reinvested ourselves in in um, uh, engaging with our communities, but we've also at the Walters taken a step and said, well, actually, do we really know what our communities want? And so um, the first step is to find out what they want and then you can try to, um, to respond to, to those things. Um, and I think uh, one other thing that we've been doing in terms of um, special exhibitions, and, and this can also apply to permanent collections as well and their reinstallations, is to um, ask some sort of key questions. Um, and the ones that we've been starting to ask about our upcoming projects is, why Baltimore, why now? Um, and just to sort of continually ground ourselves. I mean, you know, I could wax poetic about some obscure, you know, item from the middle ages that nobody cares about than me, but um, far better would be to really try to um, make that connection with, with the community and to make sure that we're holding ourselves accountable um, to, to make something that is, that is relevant to, to folks um, visiting our museum today. I'd like to um, add on to Christine's um, really cogent points about um, collecting practices and taste and, and grounding, um, reorienting to ground in the communities in which um, museums are embedded. Um, but I would also like to say that, you know, as, um, as our team at the Baltimore Museum of Art is reconsidering our collections um, and considering the histories in which um, these collections were formed, Another thing that I think we all need to be addressing or confronting is the ways in which certain kinds of genre of making have been um, reified. And the hagiography of certain kinds of art objects such as painting. So how can, how can we include the work of enslaved laborers or women who were um, excluded from ateliers or um, various kinds of studio practices because of um, the norms and mores of um, earlier centuries um, and made different kinds of um, artistic expression um, and found ways to create beauty um, with what they had around them. How can we bring those kinds of objects into the collection and um, kind of educate our, our boards and our accession committees about the values of those kinds of objects and the histories and the social histories that they share. Great. I'd also just add um, artists, right? I just had the amazing experience of working with Lorraine O'Grady on a monographic exhibition of her work that was installed in critique in historical galleries throughout the institution. So a monographic project that actually overtook a historical institution in the form of critique of each of the galleries that she was installed within from Egyptian galleries to historical American landscape painting galleries to European painting and um, feminist galleries. Um, the, the ability of an artist to enter into a, um, a different form of conversation is obviously well-known, particularly in Baltimore, and um, continues to be a very important way to engage contemporary audiences in historical conversations. Other thoughts on how you sort of bring in the whole, uh, if not, we can move on. We're, we're moving right along. We've only got a half an hour left. Um, and I do want to get to 
this question about um, sort of developing the next generation. Um, the, so the 2015 Mellon Foundation survey report described uh, what it described a youth bulge among female art museum staff, by which they did not mean pregnancy, but they meant when you segment the workforce by decade born, the younger the staff, the more female it is. So one of the survey's more troubling findings was that there's no comparable youth bulge among non-white museum workers, art museum workers. So while conscious sustained attention to uh, equitable hiring and promotion practices should lead to greater gender equity and gender diversity of museum leadership over time, unless uh, museum professionals, young people of color enter the field in greater numbers, even the most equitable hiring and promotion practices are not going to lead to comparable gains in uh, racial and ethnic diversity at the top. And decades of museum pipeline programs styled as minority internships or multicultural internships, which full disclosure, I've been the beneficiary of my very first job out of college was um, at the National Gallery of Art as an intern in what they called the internships in the museum profession for minorities program. Um, and that was 30 years ago, almost 30 years ago. Uh, and I, I'd like to see more data on this or do more research on this, but my, my eyeballs tell me that we should be further along if, that, if, if those programs were working. Um, so I think you know, something is, 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 is happening, that it's not enough to just push people, uh, more, more people um, into existing uh, structures. But I'm, I'd love to hear you know, your, your, your ideas um, on what are the reasons for this? What does this mean for how we go about cultivating and preparing the next generation of museum professionals and leaders? Um, and should we be looking beyond the conventional pathways into the field? You know? um, so Lauren, you've talked in interviews about um, the power of representation you know, and seeing, seeing women like you in positions of power in art museums and, and um, those early role models being so influential for you. And you've also talked about how one of the things that attracted you to your current position was the idea of having students as primary stakeholders. So maybe you could start us off on your thoughts about, um, about bringing folks into the field. Sure. Um, I think for me, I think a lot about students as because that's when I first got into museums. You know, I went to Oberlin College, Sharon Patton, African-American woman was the director at the time. The collection had some really great works of art um, by artists, um, still does, including artists like Alison Saar, Rashid Johnson. I remember those works very clearly, um, and I credit them to one of the reasons why I'm in this field. Um, and I also credit sort of not knowing that there was a, that having Dr. Patton as the director was a, not, was a rarity, right? Because I didn't know this. I was like, oh, this woman is in charge. This means this is a place, a field where people like me can be. Um, it wasn't until after, and I was sort of already down this path that I realized how rare that was. Um, and then I also think a lot about, you know, all of our, the amazing sort of internships and diversity programs. And, you know, in the last few years, large, many museums have committed to having in paid, some paid internships, fellowships for, people of color in the museum across all departments, right? So not just curatorial, but I also think about who is supervising these people, like who is really the person that they're working with most closely, because that can really, I think, um, either have something click for someone or have someone say, oh, you know what, I'm not gonna do this. And I think there's not enough training given to people who are supervising fellows or internships, particularly around ideas of diversity, microaggressions, macro, all of that, right? All of these trainings that really are important for as tedious as they can be sometimes. And I think until we really get to the point of saying, oh, well, just having a person of color and as a fellow at your institution, that's not enough. If they're not being supported, if they are supported, if they are literally the only person of color that they see or the only person of color in a certain department and they're not given access to others, then I think we're gonna to continue to see this failure. Um, I know there's questions around, again, the conversation around labor and pay and inequity, like that until those conversations are really hashed out and this idea that 
you know, not everyone can afford to do unpaid internships. I couldn't have. And I was lucky enough that I did it, but it, they weren't even an option in my mind, if that makes sense. Like I couldn't apply to any of them. So had there not been paid opportunities, had I not really, again, had great mentors, you know, my first museum job was at the Brooklyn Museum working for Terry Carbone and American Art. Um, she hired me again, sometimes I'm like, why? Um, but it was a great first experience, but it also was one that had she not been my boss, who knows, right? And I think we can't try to keep diversifying our field unless we actually pay a little bit more attention to who are people's bosses and who's actually meant to help create these pathways. Here, here, Lauren, I, I just, I, I know I don't want to talk too much, so I will just say this and then but not, but I will say everything you said is absolutely true. Um, the trainings that uh, those who are supervising the interns um, and the kinds of opportunities that those interns get um, in terms of exposure. I think there's also class and cultural hurdles that we need to talk about. And, and uh, frankly, the university hurdle. Uh, for me, I wish that we could start bringing in folks when they're tiny, you know, when they're in middle school to start thinking about a museum profession. Um, to start thinking about seeing themselves in the museum field. I didn't enter a museum until I was in college, um, like you, Lauren. So I, I think that's what you were saying. So for me, I didn't think that a museum was a place for me, um, both in terms of cultural, you know, systemic cultural beliefs about what Asians are meant to be doing in the world, but also because um, it was a primarily white institution um, framework. So I think that those are some of the issues for me in terms of creating that pipeline that we all talk about is um, getting folks when they're younger um, and making them wanting, making them want to be in a museum and work towards that as a college goal um, or even you know, get the funding that they need to get into college and to come to a place like a museum. Yeah. That that's it. Go ahead, Catherine. I just want to add, and again, I don't want to take up too much time, but um, I keep thinking about this very succinct way that Lorraine O'Grady described her experience of working in white space feminism. And she said it was always a hostess and guest model. And I think that that is very accurate in relationship to expectations about entering into this field. We still very much operate in an assimilationist model. Yes. and thinking about what that means within our institutions in relationship to actually making space from people seeing other people to also seeing the outcomes of change as a result of other people is, um, I think, a very important part of that. Yeah. I, that that resonates. I know I'm not a panelist, but I, I, that resonates very strongly with me because that, that has been my own journey sort of and of, of assimilation and, and kind of a, a belated, you know, embarrassingly late recognition of the fact that that's how I got where I am by not challenging anyone, by being acceptable. And, you know, there's a, there's a particular, um, you know, aspect of this for, for Asians, you know, and the whole model minority myth and the, the way that, you know, we were acceptable to the white mainstream because we didn't challenge them and we were also able, you know, be, um, we could be used to sort of help oppress the non-model minority, right? I mean, the whole term suggests like that there's a, there's a problem, you know, if you have to have minorities, at least you could be like this, you know? And so just kind of wrestling with all of that and what that means for me and, and, and how do we um, diversify you know, truly not just for, pe not just people who look different, but think the same or look different, but don't challenge, but who actually are different and can be their full authentic selves. I mean, that is what we really have to struggle with. How do we create that? How do we foster that? How do we really, really value that? Well, and that goes back to the history of our institutions, right? An institution like the Brooklyn Museum was founded on a model of training people to like certain things, look at certain things, prioritize certain things. And so, you know, the um, institutional critique that is at hand is, um, goes very much back to that. Yeah. Um, any additional thoughts before we sort of open it up for more questions? Um, 
I just want a little bit add a little bit. You know, we talk about the importance of, of you know pipeline and, and internship and, and the mentors. But I think when we think of mentorship and the support. We should not just stop at the internship level. I think for a lot of you know um, younger people who just entered the museum, you know, I think that is also incredibly, you know, actually difficult time period, right? Basically, you transition from a student into you know really you know a full time work, you know, person working in a professional level, and even maybe you had a lot of internships before at different places, or maybe not, you know, but that's a very limited exposure of the industry and the field you're working on. So like even with after entering the museum field, I think, you know, still, you know, either working with your direct supervisor or, you know, with someone else in a different department, you know, but in, within the museum or even a different institution. But I think that mentorship, you know, and that kind of support should continue beyond what we're just talking about internship. Another Another piece of this for me is thinking about, you know, when I think about pathways and I mean, I'm also, I guess I'm thinking about sort of qualifications and what, what do we need, you know, truly to, to do our jobs, to, to, to be curators, to, you know, to do that well, or to work in, in museums and sort of advance uh, museum practice and, and, and make museums sort of, you know, better places to work, more responsive to their communities. Um, and I think about, you know, I like Asma, Asma, I am, I mean, I have, I, I was an art historian who became a lawyer. I mean, we did it the opposite way, but um, we, we both um, have, you know, law school and sort of legal world training. And what was happening when I was in law school was, which was after Asma, um, you know, there was a lot of uh, discussion around the curriculum and, and sort of actually, teaching more practical skills, you know, and, and sort of less doc ways to, to teach the doctrine in a way that would allow um, also skill building because what the, what, um, what the law schools were hearing from the law firms was like, you, you're sending me these really great smart students, but they don't know how to do anything and they don't have the skills and they don't, you know, to sort of succeed. And, and also this is happening simultaneous with, um, I think I sort of a, a little, crisis uh, in the in the law firm world too of realizing how how non-inclusive they were and sort of the obstacles that, that they were seeing to uh, barriers you know to promote advancement for women and for for attorneys of color so sort of trying to think like how you know what what is it really that makes a good lawyer and, and what do we need from the law schools that train them and I wonder whether you know and so in the, in the museum field um, you know we we have this expectation, you know, you get an art history degree, you get a master's, you get a PhD, full disclosure, I don't have a PhD. Um, you know, it is that, but, but when we think about sort of how do we connect authentically with our audiences, how do we build inclusive environments, you know, we, we want to see people who are, who are empathetic, you know, who, who are generous, um, who, uh, you know, compa have compassion, who kind of can see, uh, the bigger picture and, 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 you know, have some, some self-awareness around, um, you know, around, around the issues that are facing us. So I don't know, does that have implications for how we train museum professionals or how the curriculum um, of a, of a museum, you know, even of our history, let alone museum studies. I wonder if any of you have, have sort of thoughts on the skills of, you know, the sort of non-traditional qualifications for the work, or sort of what, what would make better curators in the future future. You know, I went directly from undergrad into working, so I do not have a master's degree. I don't have a PhD, um, but I've been in the field now for a good amount of time. Um, and I also am a contemporary curator, so I think there's also a difference in skill sets that go across sort of discipline, across what people are interested in. I think also across the type of institution that people work at. Um, I think for sure there are probably some base level skills that all curators should have, or at least have a working knowledge of, but I think it truly depends on what type of institution you're at. I think, you know, there are some institutions that value community a lot more and a lot more of like engaging with and that being a part of it. Um, and there are some who maybe say they do, but actually don't. And then there are those that just don't pretend like, or like that's not the work of the curator, right? That's a different department. Um, I have enjoyed spending 
my career institutions that care about and think about the communities that they're in. And um, so for me, that's a huge part of the training that I even understand also moving to different places and understanding how do you get to know a different community. Um, but I also think as we are talking about diversifying the field um, and not just along all different types of the spectrum, I think we really do need to think about people with different backgrounds. You know, I read job postings, people send them to me to send to my networks. And I'm like, you actually really don't need a person for the PhD for this entry level position. Like, why, why are you saying this? Is it just because this is what the original posting from 30 years ago said, and you haven't actually updated it? Like, really? So I think there's this idea that all museums before posting any position um, really need to look and read and think a lot about what are the skills that are needed and not just the skills that previously were needed because that was what was supposed to be done. Other thoughts? Okay, um, let me looking at the chat here and seeing what's come in. So um, this kind of goes back to the well, discussion we were having sort of about the different types of labor that happen in the museum and the, the sort of anonymity of certain segments of, of the workforce. Um, so this is a question from a young attendee, self-identified young attendee. I know as a younger individual about to enter into the museum workforce, I was wondering if you could discuss hierarchical distinctions that sometimes aren't addressed between the different departments within museums and even between different educational levels. For example, the differences between curatorial education, registration development, et cetera. Um, how is your practice as a curator? How have you worked to break down barriers between departments? Or how would you recommend others within the field working to shift the narrative of hierarchies within the museum? Um, so thoughts on, you know, and I'll just lead with my observation that, you know, that of working in organizations that are big and, and over time sort of silo themselves, right? And, and there's a very clear lines of this is, this. we do this over here, we do this over here, we do this over here and maybe um, not enough communication or cross-functional, you know, sharing of authority or, or ability to sort of make the decisions collaboratively. So I'm wondering how, how do you guys, um, you know, what are the challenges that you've observed and how do you, how do you um, attack them? Who wants, does anyone want to take that or start? Um, <laughs> You know, I think that the, the three examples that the, the, the person who posed the question um, listed are interesting, right? Curatorial, conservation, and education. Um, very different, but highly related expertise, each of them. Um, the, uh, it's, it's interesting to me, you know, I came of age uh, and for a very long time, I was an independent curator, which when I was an independent curator was basically code for looking for a job. Um, and now the, um, the field of curatorial practice has taken on a kind of shine <laughs> that, that, that wasn't there when I started. And it's, it remains sort of interesting to me. But as I said earlier, you know, there is a way which I think in my, from what I understand from colleagues and peers in my institution is that curators are seen as being extremely powerful. Um, in my experience. Also, educators are the most extremely, have the most extreme foresight <laughs> and bring the most um, challenges and growth and opportunities to think collectively. That is their training and it is an extraordinarily important part of um, obviously the goal of the organization. And yet that field and that part of the institution is somehow often framed as supportive when in fact it is not that. And I think that that's an important thing to say. Conservation is a very in interesting um, segment of the institution to bring up because of all of, the, all of the fields. I like, as Lauren, I have a master's. I do not have a PhD. I've always felt, you know, imposter syndrome. Um, but um, conservation is a highly specific field with very specific educational requirements and um, is also so integral to one of the most important parts, obviously, of the institution, which is collections. And the notion of how we talk about collections as opposed to 
um, exhibitions in relationship to education, to conservation, and to curatorial practice is also really fascinating to me. So I don't know that I have an answer for, for a description of the hierarchies, but I would say that they are absolutely seen as very different universes that somehow sometimes intersect. And I think one of the really fascinating opportunities we have right now is to um, really focus on those intersections and to invite each other into conversations that in the past, in a more siloed era, we wouldn't have. Asma. Yeah, I just, I, I totally agree with what Catherine is saying. And I want to say two points. One, I think that the role of the curator along with what Lauren was saying has changed. I don't think that um, a curator, no matter what your specialty, say, you know, Christine, you know, you're a medievalist or Christina, you're um, in East Asia. I don't think that the curator, no matter what your specialty, should spend all their time in the libraries with their nose in a book or looking at, you know, various art fairs and galleries um, to, to get to know the objects. I think that the, the contemporary curator, and by contemporary, I mean of this, of this epoch, of this era, has to be able to engage with civilians, with non-art specialists, and find a way to make the, their knowledge understood by people of all backgrounds. And I think um, those of us who have gone to law school can, can relate that when you graduate, you wanna use all of the legalese, you wanna sound very fancy and trot out all of your you know, legal terms. And art historians are just as guilty, curators are just as guilty, and we need to put an end to that. Um, so that to me is, is um, one of the main things I see in terms of the most um, energizing and inspirational curators I see working today is that they have found a way to connect with everybody, to let down their egos, et cetera, um, and be able to relate. And the second thing is, you know, something that our director um, at the BMA has done, Chris has done, is to make sure that those who are in other different departments have a seat at the table in terms of talking about the art. So we have, you know, Lexington Market is the oldest public market in the United States. Um, and we are working, um, and I should say the we here is our education colleagues are working um, extremely creatively and thinking outside the box in, in terms of the ways the museum can come to the market and, um, and engage with the communities there. And that requires a cross departmental collaboration with the registrars, um, with the conservators. I'm not saying that we're trotting out our um, Van Dyke, uh, Ronaldo and Armida um, to the Lexington market, but you know, to think much more um, collaboratively about the ways in which art can engage with those of us um, who are out on, who are not coming into the museums. And I wanna, um, Asma, that's uh, uh, related to that. I wanna um, note something that I, you know, I think another thing that sort of ties together this also, like how do we, have more sort of equal dignity and respect among all of the different departments, you know, and not this notion of like professionals and service providers. Um, but, you know, to the extent that a museum wants to reach out to its community and to Christine's point, like know what the community wants or is thinking, or, you know, I would also remind museums that your own staff is your community. They live in the community and that is a tremendous resource, um, you know, for, for a museum. And that's one of the things, you know, that I think about the National Gallery, how do we, you know, tr how do we make our staff, you know, our first audience or, you know, and co-equal, you know, with the, when we think about the visitor, we're really thinking also about, about the, um, the staff who, who haven't historically had a seat at that table. Um, so there's a couple questions. Um, oh, Lauren, were you raising your hand or just, just scratching? Okay. Um, an interesting question, um, a student, uh, an MA student at American University um, asking, you know, for someone who, about the ethics of taking an unpaid internship, sort of recognizing that privilege, I guess, of, of you know, being able to do that. like. Do, do the job seekers, do the young people coming in have any leverage or, um, you know, what can they do to kind of push institutions to, um, to be more diverse and inclusive? Um, you know, how can they ensure that institutions that they're thinking about working at are supporting diversity, et cetera? Um, 
that's interesting. The ethics of taking an unpaid internship, you know, perpetual, you know, I, that's something I've thought about just, again, like I said, I was lucky to not have to do that, take an unpaid internship, but um, had I had the circumstances been such, you know, I, I, I might've been able to make that work and I would have probably done it without thinking about that, that I was, you know, it's, it's later in my career that I've come to realize that all the different ways in which my past actions may have, you know, just led to perpetuating a system that I, you know, that I, that is problematic. Um, what advice do you guys have for students coming in about holding institutions accountable, I guess? I mean, it's- I think that there's enough of a shift in the field at this point, and particularly in relationship to the paid internship question that that is a viable option. You know, I mean, to, to push on that question, to um, ask for paid internship, to explore what the other benefits of a situation might be, whether it's some kind of stipend for travel, um, access to health insurance, what, whatever the, the, the benefits situation can be. Um, I think 10 years ago, that would probably have been a much harder um, position to try and put oneself in at the beginning of their career. But I think now it is an open question and one can ask it that way and should. Yeah, I um, at Boston, we actually announced that moving forward, our museum will only have paid internship. And actually, we started implementing it already. Um, but, you know, of course, you know, with, right now with limited funding, you know, so actually the museum have, can only take, you know, a um, limited number of paid internship. But, you know, we all think that's a very positive um, way of moving forward. And I know the museums make an effort to raise more money to support um, this program. But I also want to say that, you know, since we just started in implementing it, so um, just give an example, there's basically an open call to the whole museum, you know, who wants to participate, you know, first of all, which department, which person wants to take on this program and, you know, host a, 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 in, a paid intern. And then once that's decided, and then the, the, the museum, you know, we posted the limited ones and, you know, how out of Asia we we are going to host one. But one thing for me, it's also interesting to see this is that I was expecting we would have more uh, applicants since it is a paid internship, but actually uh, the, uh, the application is not to the number that I hope it would be. So, you know, I don't know, you know, we're still trying to understand what it what it is, is maybe because it's so new. So we didn't do enough publicity. So not enough people are aware of it or, um, or just, you know, because, you know, there's still this systematic, you know, kind of bias or people just not don't feel comfortable getting into this paid internship program, whatever it is. But, you know, I just want to say, you know, I do feel, you know, the museum field is moving, you know, positively in, you know, in this direction. But I think it's still a lot of work to do. I also think along the lines of like um, young People or people coming into the field thinking about questions of if they should take a paid or unpaid internship. I think the other questions you ask in an interview can also help show that change is important, right? If you do ask about the diversity of the entire staff, ask sort of what commitments the institution has made to these conversations, because I think um, there are some institutions who are doing this work because they think they should or know that it's like what's happening. But I think until people who are trying to come into the field really push and say, no, this is important. These are the questions that I have. Um, and be willing to, if you don't like the answers, maybe not take that position, um, I think is also an important part of it because otherwise the change is only going to feel very surface and it's going to feel like, okay, well, now we have this paid internship. So we did it, but it's actually okay. But if you have these interns here who are from different backgrounds, again, like how are you supporting them? What are you doing to help their growth in the field across the board? Yeah, that's a great- Such a great point, Lauren. That's one thing I think, you know, really encouraging everyone to recognize that they do have agency, right? Um, and, and can make those choices. I know that it feels hard and that there's not very many jobs and people feel like, you know, if you want to work in this field, you have to kind of take what, what you get. But, um, but I think, you know, I think in, in a way that that has kind of let, let the system perpetuate itself. Um, and that talented people um, should think about, you know, what kind of organization do I want to work with for and really um, let themselves um, expect high, expect more. 
So we are at time. So believe it or not, an hour and a half has gone by. This has been su such a great conversation. I'm, I'm so grateful to all of you for your time, for your thoughtfulness um, in, in taking these questions and thinking about these issues. You've given me a lot to think about. Um, and I just, I'm, thank you. Thank you very, very much. And thank you to, uh, to the, our, our back end support, um, the folks who put this program together and kept it running smoothly. Thank you to all of the attendees. Thank you for your thoughtful questions. Um, wishing everybody a good, a good weekend. And, and thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all. And uh, finally, just a uh, last minute remark. Thank you, everyone. It was such a thought provoking di discussion uh, that tells us where we were, where we are and uh, where we can go forward. Such a great ending uh, to the seventh Feminist Art History Conference. On behalf of the organizing committee, uh, we thank you everyone here, um, the moderator, panelists, um, uh, everyone on the backstage and all our participants. Thank you all. And uh, we wish um, our con conversation will con continue in various forms in the future. Thank you.